now we're going to talk about various items we're going to use to measure the current and the potential difference. We have something called an ammeter and something called a voltmeter. Hopefully you can figure out which one measures current and which one measures voltage. I'll leave that one up to you. It'll be a quiz later. We need to decide for our ammeter whether, and these are little things you need to know about how to use an ammeter and how it's designed. So that's what we're going to go through here is how to put an ammeter in a circuit to measure what? Good for you. And what you need to know about the resistance of the ammeter and why. So let's walk through how we're going to put an ammeter so in a circuit. So you need to decide, am I going to put the ammeter in series with the object that I'm trying to measure the current through? So we're trying to measure the current through this resistor. Or am I going to put that ammeter in parallel? Or actually, let me draw it slightly differently. Or am I going to put it in parallel or what we call across the resistor? <coughs> so am I going to put the ammeter in like this? Which way is going to measure the current through the resistor? The cylinder. Series. In series. Okay. So step one, understand that if you put it in parallel with the resistor, it will not measure the current through the resistor, it'll just measure whatever current happens to be going through the ammeter. You can see here in series, the charges, the little antiporter charges go through the ammeter. Yay! I can cover the resistor too. Yay! Okay. So the ammeter needs to be number one in series. Number two. Whenever you are measuring the current or the potential difference in a circuit, you want to change that circuit as little as possible. Right? You don't want to have the presence of whatever you're using to measure it change the circuit. By definition, will it change the circuit? Yes. Simply by measuring it, it changes the current in the circuit. You want to have it change it as little as possible. Therefore, what do you know about the resistance of an ammeter? Does it need to be very large or very small? Like, very small. So an ammeter is in series and has a small resistance. Okay, we're going to ask the same questions about a voltmeter. So, do we put a voltmeter in series? By the way, if you missed the symbols for voltmeter and meter and ammeter, just look on the board. Do we put a voltmeter in series or in parallel with the item we're trying to measure the potential difference across class. Parallel, right? Again, this is going to be some other potential difference. I don't know what it's going to be. So this is, if we're going to put a voltmeter in parallel with whatever you're trying to measure. And Again, you want the presence of your voltmeter slash ammeter to have as little change to the circuit as possible. Therefore, Travis, what do you know about the resistance of a voltmeter? Um, is it going to be very high or very low? Very high. Very high. Why is the electric potential difference across a voltmeter going to be very high? Why? Why would we need the potential difference across the voltmeter to be very high? John? So um, the current that goes through it is small. So that the current that goes through the voltmeter is very small. Otherwise, you are going to change the current through the resistor a lot. Right? No matter what, you have to have some charges go through the voltmeter in order to measure something. But you want the resistance to be very large. So resistance is very large. Again, the whole goal here is to decrease the change to the circuit. So you want to keep as many charges, as much current going through the resistor you're trying to measure the potential difference across as possible, keep it to be the same. So you want to have it as, as few as possible go through the voltmeter. So the larger the resistance of the voltmeter, the fewer 
charges that go through it. So basics of an ammeter and a voltmeter. Now we need to figure out how to make an ammeter or a voltmeter. You make an ammeter or a voltmeter out of something called a galvanometer. I'm sorry, galvanometer. Yeah. A galvanometer uses the fact that a loop, in a current carrying loop in a magnetic field causes a torque on it. Which we haven't gotten to yet, but don't you worry, we will. What you need to know right now is that a galvanometer measures small currents. Measures small currents. So a, an ammeter is made from a galvanometer. A voltmeter is made from a galvanometer. Let's start out by talking about a galvanometer, uh, I'm sorry, an ammeter made using a galvanometer. Yes? What kind of range counts as like small? Doesn't matter. On the order of milliamps, doesn't really matter. So we have the resistor, we're trying to measure the resistance across. R sub M, the one we're trying to measure. Remind me, we're measuring the um, current through it. So does the ammeter go in parallel or in series, class? Series. In series. So the ammeter is going to be right here. It's going to be in this box. Our goal is to get this ammeter to have a small resistance. Now, all galvanometers have some sort of middle resistance. So the resistance of the galvanometer is going to be approximately 100 ohms. Some middle resistance. It's not very large, not very small. So we need to get this galvanometer to have a small resistance. How are we going to have, get the galvanometer to have a small resistance? We're going to combine it with the resistor. How? We're going to combine it with the resistor in parallel. So we're going to have our galvanometer, and we're going to have our resistor. This is the resistor that we're going to put in parallel with the galvanometer. So this piece right from here to here is the ambient. Now, the resistance that we put in parallel with the galvanometer is going to be a large or a small resistance. It's going to be a large or a small resistance. Check. Large. A very large resistance. Why? Because uh, when you want the equivalent resistance, you 1 over the resistance G plus 1 over the resistance parallel. And ah, but having a large resistance here actually will increase I'm, I'm sorry, with, it will still decrease the resistance of the galvanometer, but the smaller this resistance that we add in parallel, the smaller the total resistance will be. I agree, by adding one in parallel, it decreases the resistance, right? But we want this resistance uh, that we're putting in parallel to be very small. That is how you create an ammeter from the galvanometer. You put a very small resistor in parallel with the galvanometer. Now we want to create a voltmeter. So we have our resistor. This is the resistor we're going to measure the potential difference across. Class, the voltmeter is going to be in parallel or in series? Parallel. Parallel. So this is our voltmeter. From here to here, it's our voltmeter. Now, we need to get the resistance of the voltmeter to be very large. How are we going to get the resistance of our voltmeter to be very large, considering our galvanometer has a middle ground resistance? John? Put it in series with another resistor. Put it in series with what kind of resistor? A very large one. A very large resistor. So we're going to have a resistor that we're going to put in series with our galvanometer, such that this resistor in series 
is very long. So this is our voltmeter. That is how you create. That is how you create a voltmeter and an ammeter out of a galvanometer. And we've gone through where you put the ammeters and the resistances, and so on and so forth. All stuff that is popular for, although it's also come up on previous response questions, is popular on multiple choice questions. But you can see how it would be a popular multiple choice question. But again, there have been ones where in a free response question they ask you to um, like create a circuit and put the galvanometer, I'm sorry, the ammeter and the voltmeter. Now, we're going to take a few moments and talk about outlets in your house. Household wiring. Remind me the electric potential difference across the outlets here in the United States class are what? 120 volts. Now, we also have some that are at 240, right? Your air conditioner, for example. We're going to talk about how it is that we get 120 volts and why you have three plugs instead of just two. So, in your house, you have wires that go through your house. You have one that is at 120 volts. You have one that's at zero volts, and you have one that's at negative 120 volts. These two are called live wires, the ones that are at positive and negative 120 volts. This is your neutral, what's called a ground. Why is it called a ground? Because it's connected to the ground. If you go outside your house, you should find a wire that goes to a pole that goes into the ground. And that is your ground. Literally what it means. Remember, the ground is an infinite well of charge. You can take or remove charge, take or remove, take or remove charge as much as you want. Because there is an infinite well of charge. Is it true that there's an infinite well? No. Is it close? It's close enough. Okay. That's what the ground is. So in your house, you have two that are plugged in right here, 120 volts, between the uh, positive 120 and zero, or between the negative 120 and zero, the electric potential difference is still 120 volts, regardless of whether you go from 120 to zero or from zero to 120. If you want to get something that runs off of 240 volts, you connect all the way from, you connect both live wires so that you have a total electric potential difference of 240 volts. In order to understand the three different wires and why you have them, we have a visual for you. It just turned on. Nice. We have a visual for you. Now, oh, let's do that first. I forgot. Let's do this first. So, you have these. This is a circuit breaker. When I was a child, when I was a child, we didn't really have circuit breakers. We had fuses. So let's the first. Let's talk about a fuse and how a fuse works because it's easier to understand that first before you understand a circuit breaker. So a fuse. You have a 15 amp fuse, a 20 amp fuse, and a 30 amp fuse, just like you have a circuit breaker. These are designed to do what? So this is active. There's too much amps. If you get two, if you get up to 15 amps through a fuse, that fuse will break. How? It burns. It burns, right? Power equals I squared times R. They create it out of a material such that if it gets 15 amps going through it, it will heat up enough where it will actually break. That's the bummer of a fuse, because if you break a fuse, you have to replace the fuse. So we replace fuses with circuit breakers. The whole concept with a circuit breaker is you make a circuit breaker out of two different types of materials with two different thermal coefficients of expansion. And 
at high temperatures, it, that material then will actually bend. And if you get up to a certain temperature, it will break the circuit. By the time you get down there, current will no longer be going through the circuit, and it will have cooled down enough, and you can flip the switch back so that it will then be, you can then have a circuit. So it's much cheaper. This is an example of a bimetallic strip. It is made of two different materials that have two different thermal coefficients of expansion. In other words, when I take a flame and I heat it, it bends, as you can see. This is the exact same thing that happens in your circuit breaker. Right. <laughs> two different materials such that this, this one on the inside here is going to expand less than the one on the outside, therefore it curves. So this is how a circuit breaker works. Now, in your household wiring, you have three plugs. You have, hmm, which one can I unplug? I don't think I can unplug any of them. Oh, we'll do this one here. <laughs> Oh, it doesn't matter. You all know what a plug looks like. So we have three plugs. Okay? <laughs> Sorry, I just did okay. You all know what they look like. You have three plugs. One is connected to a live wire. One is connected to neutral ground. And the third one is also connected to neutral ground. And it's important to understand why you have two different neutral grounds. And the idea here is to make sure that you stay safe. So we took Scott Shikaitis, Mr. Shikaitis, and we put him in one of our uh, pictures. Oh, it looks like it, although, doesn't it? To me, that looks like Mr. Shinkai. <laughs> and if he has current going through him, he says, ouch. Oh. So here's the deal. If you only had one live wire and a neutral wire, in general, what would happen is the current would go through the machinery and then go back through the neutral wire. But if you are holding the item and something goes wrong and that neutral wire breaks, that current is going to go through the only path available for it, which is you. And you don't want that. Right? You do not want current going through you. So instead of having one neutral wire, we actually have two neutral wires, two grounds. And the appliances are designed such that if the, one of the neutral ground breaks, it will then go through the other neutral ground rather than you. If both of them break, then we have ground fault interrupters, which we'll talk about in a little while. We also have circuit breakers. There are all sorts of things to try to protect. 